So you may not have the opportunity to actually use the fancier drugs like labetalol, the sodium nitroprusside in some facilities in different parts of the country. So someone asked me to actually do a video on how I would go about administering hydralazine, how I would make the dilutions, because remember it often comes as a powder in some cases. If it already comes pre-diluted, then it's much easier, but this is a lecture that is focusing pretty much on the one that comes as a powder because many of our facilities are going to be having hydralazine and this is one important drug, especially in the management of hypertensive crisis. It's not ideally a good drug per se. Uh, if you have labetalol, it's better that you use labetalol in your patients, but not all facilities are able to source the labetalol. That's why you should have some functional knowledge about how to use hydralazine. So grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is his on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to be looking at pretty much hydralazine administration. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. Drop a like, drop a comment to Zambia and beyond. Let's go. So in this particular video, I've divided it into, into pretty much like four or five parts, it's not going to be so long. So remember that hydralazine is going to be used, number one, for hypertensive crisis. So those people that have a very high BP, so I don't know, this should be in white, because if we use a red pen, people tend to complain. So remember it's going to be used in those people that have an elevated BP, especially you worrying about your systolic blood pressure, so those that have a systolic, or rather, a diastolic blood pressure, a diastolic blood pressure, not systolic, diastolic blood pressure that is greater than 110 millimeters of mercury. And remember, sometimes this is often associated with end organ damage. So in those cases, you want to actually use hydralazine to drop the BP very quickly. It's not, of course, our ideal drug, but if that's the only thing you have in your facility, then you can use that. Then the second thing is that we can use this in pregnancy, in pregnancy, because remember that it's one of the drugs that can be used in this pregnancy-induced hypertension, hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Again, your reference BP is going to be your diastolic blood pressure that is greater than 110. Now, generally, what dose of hydralazine are we, are we using? And remember that most of our hydralazine in our facilities is going to come as an IV formulation. There are some oral pills that are available on the market, but this discussion is just going to be focusing solely on the IV administration of hydralazine. So generally, the dose that we're going to be using is about 0.1 to about 0.5 milligrams per kg per dose. Okay, this can be given every six to eight hours. Then you can actually titrate upwards, um, depending on the response of the patient, by about two milligrams per kg every six hours. So by about two milligrams per kg per dose every six hours. That's how you can titrate it. But usually our usual dose that we're going to be giving for our patients that come in with these hypertensive emergencies uh, is going to be roughly around five to ten uh, milligrams of hydralazine that we're going to be giving in these patients to drop their BPs quite quickly. So how exactly do we dilute this hydralazine? I'm going to Divide this into two steps. So step one is you diluting the powder so that you can make it into a liquid. Because remember that it's going to come as a powder. So the ampule of hydralazine is going to be coming as a powder that predominantly has 20 milligrams of hydralazine. So it's going to be a 20 milligram powder of hydralazine. So now remember you want to get this powder to make it into a liquid. So you want to get this and make it into a liquid. Now what are you going to do to this? You can add water for injection, water for injection. Hydralazine is also uh, compatible with normal saline or our 0.9% saline or saline, however you want to pronounce that. So 
we're going to be adding either water for injection. Let me just say water for injection here because people can misculture these days. So water for injection or your normal saline. So you're going to be adding one mil of either water for injection or one mil either of normal saline. And now what you're going to create in this is a 20 milligram. So in one mil of that solution, you're going to be having 20 milligrams of hydralazine, 20 milligrams of hydralazine. So it means the concentration that you have created is that you're going to have 20 milligrams per mil. So if you if you get that whole mil that you have created and you inject it into the patient, you flush it into the patient's IV cannula, it means that you're going to be injecting this patient with 20 milligrams of hydralazine. Of course, this sometimes may not be efficient because it's still quite, quite concentrated and it will drop your BPs very quickly. So we want to further dilute this hydralazine. So our step two to further dilute. So what we have created in this scenario is that we have now a patient, or rather we have this powder that was dissolved in one mil of normal saline or one mil of water for injection and we've created a solution that is equal to this one mil to give you 20 milligrams of the hydralazine. So now what you're going to do is that you're going to get 0 0.5 mils of this solution that you have created here. Now remember that if one mil gives you 20 milligrams of hydralazine, of hydralazine, it means that if we get half of that, if we get 0 0.5 mils, this should be equivalent to X. So it means our X is going to multiply by our 1 mil, our 0 0.5 is going to multiply by 20. So our X is going to be 0 0.5 multiplied by 20. That gives you a math of about 10 milligrams. So in essence, what we have gotten is 10 milligrams of the solution that we have made. Now, once we get this 10 milligrams of the solution we have made, we're going to add that 0 0.5 mils, so 0 0.5 mils of this solution that we've made, we're going to add this to about 9.5 mils of the normal saline. So 0 0.5 mils of the this 20 milligram per mil solution, we're going to add it to 9.5 mils of normal saline. So it means whatever you have created in this instance will mean that you'll have a total volume of 10 mils. But remember how much hydralazine do we have in this? We've taken 10 milligrams and we've added it to this solution to make 10 mils. So it means in essence you're going to be having 10 milligrams in about 10 mils of solution. So in essence you've created one milligram per mil. So you've created one, for, if you give one mil we've given one milligram. And remember our patient needed five to 10 milligrams. So if they are receiving the 10 milligrams, you inject the 10 milligrams slowly, of course, over 20 to 30 minutes, and then you'll be reassessing. Uh, you'll be reassessing, you inject it slowly, then you reassess after 20 to 30 minutes rather, and you should be checking your BPs until your diastolic pressure is now less than 110. So it means that if you now want smaller concentrations, if you want, like for example, 0 0.1 milligram of the concentration, all you have to do is get 0 0.1 mils of this solution. If you want 0 0.2 and so on and so forth, I think that should be very, very easy for you to understand. So that's how we do the dilution of the hydralazine. Now the side effects that are there of hydralazine, so we have common side effects that are present. So common things can be things like flushing, we often tend to see that. We often tend to see patients having tachycardia. Okay, so it means that in patients that have reflex tachycardia, or rather in patients that have severe tachycardia, we don't want to give them hydralazine. We, it can also cause palpitations in these patients. It can cause edema. It can cause GI disturbances, whatever everyone likes to go towards in the, in the pharmacology exam when they don't know about side effects, they talk about GI disturbances. And then you may sometimes also have some rare side effects that are there, like for example, you may have some blood dyscrasias, some blood dyscrasias that may be present. You may have rash, because remember hydralazine sometimes has been associated with Steven Johnson reactions, some sort of allergic reactions. You may have fever. You may have things like nasal congestion. These are just some of the rare um, side effects 
that are there in relation to hydralazine. So as you're administering your hydralazine, you want to be checking the blood pressure of the patient, you want to be checking the heart rate of the patient, you want to be checking the urea and electrolyte when you start the treatment, and of course you can also check for the anti-nuclear factor during uh, prolonged treatment of hydralazine use. So now before I actually end this uh, lecture, I want to talk about some practical points. And the first practical point I've already mentioned is that hydralazine should not be used in patients that have severe tachycardia. So hydralazine is not used in patients with severe tachycardia. So we don't use hydralazine in patients with severe tachycardia. Because remember that it's going to increase the heart rate even further. So we want to avoid it. Then Point number two is that, of course, hydralazine is going to be recommended to use with a beta blocker to actually enhance the antihypertensive effect and also to decrease that reflex tachycardia side effect. So if you are giving it orally, or for some reason, if you are giving an orally, hydralazine combined with a beta blocker would be good for a patient. So you combine it with a beta blocker it can be good for a patient. But of course, it's quite rare for us to have these hydralazine pills, especially in most of our institution. So the only formulation we often have is the IV formulation. Then of course, number three, IV labetalo is obviously going to be much better and more effective for initial control of the acute hypertensive crisis than hydralazine. So this one is going to be much, much better to use than hydralazine. If you have the labetalo, available, it's better that you, you do use the labetalo as compared to the hydralazine. And the fourth and final thing is that remember that the hydralazine here gets inactivated with the glucose solutions. So the hydralazine is not compatible. So hydralazine is not compatible, compatible with glucose, with glucose solutions or with uh, solutions that have glucose in it. So if you have anything that has glucose in it, do not mix it with hydralazine. If it's DNS, D5, D10, because it's not compatible, it will be inactivated by that glucose solution. So again, if you make the solution of hydralazine, remember it can sometimes react with the metal and it can actually cause the solution to change color. So if it changes color and becomes pinkish or yellowish, then you must discard that because it has been kept for quite some time. So you should avoid preparing the hydralazine and then keeping it for some time. You prepare, then administer the hydralazine. I really hope you enjoyed this video on hydralazine administration. If you did, consider subscribing to the channel, hit the bell notification icon so you never miss on such amazing content every time I post. To Zambia and beyond, my name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. Until next time, bye-bye.